A racist Karen tries to fire the Puerto Rican employees at a restaurant, but ends up getting herself deported instead. Subscribe to Am I the Jerk on YouTube and hit the bell to turn on notifications. I work at a fairly well-known restaurant in a small northern New England city. The owners were very successful owners of restaurants with several non-chain establishments and spent maybe a day or two a month in our location. The rest of the time, there was a general manager in charge. We'll call her Jan. Jan was about as type A as they come. She was a a middle-aged woman, but beautiful and petite, and she always looked put together and primped. Jan had started with the owners a decade earlier in their first restaurant as a server and had worked her way up to general manager over the years. At first, I just thought she had extremely high standards, which I respected. I have standards as well and take pride in my work. I had been impressed by how the kitchens were spotless. The staff was immaculate, like run a white glove hand under the back of the oven and it comes back white, kind of clean. And the food was always top quality. I had frequently been a customer and was thrilled that I got the job there. I had been in the business for a decade and the restaurant was the place in our area. I was so excited. Unfortunately, I quickly learned why everything is so shining and perfect. Jan was a tyrant. She was the kind of boss who soured the mood of the entire staff like a storm cloud hovering over us that never went away. Nothing was ever good enough and the standards changed from day to day. On a good day, she would shut herself up in the office and then leave early. Good day were very rare and could turn into bad days at the drop of a dime. On bad days, you couldn't be perfect enough and she would just come up with new rules and new regulations to punish people. If a host called out sick, they were literal children, she would berate them on the phone and make them cry. If a cook made a mistake on a plate, she would humiliate them in front of the staff, accuse them of doing it on purpose, and then give us all the silent treatment for hours. Seriously. If someone's cash was off, even by a few cents, she would accuse accuse them of theft and force me to cut down their hours. As a fellow manager, I was mostly spared her awful behavior, though I had to hear about her treatment from my staff almost every day. All of this was just run-of-the-mill bad boss stuff until it came time for our yearly staff evaluation meetings. This is where Raul enters the story. Raul was a hard-working dishwasher who had moved to our state from Puerto Rico a few years earlier and spoke English with some difficulty. Whenever I had to go over anything official with him, we would have a co-worker translate between us to make sure we were both communicating clearly. Jan refused this courtesy to Raul. This made his evaluations pretty difficult. Raul managed to communicate to us that due to some recent cuts in his hours, he would be forced to get a second job to pay the bills. Something about this absolutely set Jan off. She told him that she would fire him if he dared. I could see plainly on the intake paperwork in front of me that Raul had been hired with the understanding that it would be a full-time position. So, I pointed that out. Jan was furious, but agreed through gritted teeth that if Raul agreed not to get a second job, she would bump his hours to at least 35 hours a week. It was stated as clear as day, and I documented it in my daily manager logbook. Work went on as usual after that, and I didn't think much of this meeting again for a few months. Another time, a while later, while filing out information for my tax returns, Jan called me into the office. I could tell she had pulled the tiny room apart looking for something. Thing. All of the information about our Puerto Rican employees is gone! She told me with a mixture of panic and suspicion. I looked at the files in question and they all seemed to be in order, so I was confused and told her that I couldn't help. A few minutes later, I walked back in the office to find her arguing with Rosa, our most talented chef and a Puerto Rican native. Rosa was perfectly fluent in English. No, Rosa! Jan was speaking to Rosa as though she were hard of hearing or mentally slow. Where is your green card? What are you talking about? Rosa was confused. Are you an illegal or something? Is that why one of you broke in here to hide the proof? Jan wasn't fully yelling, but her eyes were cold and flashing with rage. What? Rosa was starting to get angry now. It suddenly clicked for me, so I interrupted. Jan, uh, you do realize that Puerto Rico is a United States territory, right? Of course I I know that! Okay, so you know that Rosa has a social security number like any other American native. Oh, right. Never mind, Rosa. You can go back to work. Jan did not apologize for accusing Rosa of theft. I was so done with this place after that. Jan did all kinds of little things like that, and she never apologized. I had already gotten a job offer for a place closer to my house when the final straw came. I was the closing manager one day and got in just before the dinner rush to see Rosa. 
Raul storming out the back door. He didn't speak much English, but his F and B was very clear. Jan had lied about raising his hours to 35 hours per week. So Raul had gotten the second job that he talked about. When Jan found out, she fired him, but not before saying something about all you illegals are the same. She was really fixated on these American citizens being illegal aliens for some reason. By this point, I hated this woman. She once told me that my clothing made me look poor in front of the whole staff. I was wearing what she made me wear. Meanwhile, she wore open-toed shoes behind the line, which is against health codes, and once her fake nail fell off into the coleslaw and she wouldn't let anyone toss it out after she retrieved it. This is just the tip of the iceberg, but I have a life to live. Since I knew I would be leaving soon anyway, I told Raul he should go after our boss for wrongful termination since I had documented proof with Jan's signature that he had been promised more hours and that Jan had broken the agreement, not Raul. The last time I saw Jan was on my way out of Raul's lawyer's office after giving a deposition about several labor laws she had violated, at least the ones that I knew about. Apparently, there were many others that she had broken in front of other employees. She couldn't even look me in the eye. The best part, in my deposition, I learned that Jan was actually the one who was illegally in the country. Her green card had recently expired. She was Canadian. She ended up being sent back to Canada as a result of this case, and no one has heard from her since. Raul was granted six months of unemployment pay, plus the restaurant had to pay his legal fees. They closed that location not long after. Maybe they should hire their managers more carefully next time. How would Jan not know if they're illegal citizens or not? Because if she's been working with this company all the way since back when she was a server, she must have some information about the hiring process. And in that process, she would know if she was hiring somebody who was an illegal citizen or not. So how could this even happen? Even if she took over for someone else, in that situation, she just would have assumed that the person that was in her position before her hired illegal workers and she just kept them on, even though every other part of her personality is about this hyper micromanagement. Every single thing has to be up to T, even to the point that you could take a white glove and rub it behind an oven and it's still a white glove. That seems like a very odd contradiction in her personality where one side of her is incredibly by the book and the other side she's not and then she gets mad and takes it out on these workers who she assumes are illegally working there in the first place. In this story, I feel for Raul because he needed enough hours to survive. He was promised all those hours and then he didn't get them. So he had to adapt in order to just get by and then he was punished for that. What else could Jan have thought was going to happen? He can either survive or he can't. And if you don't let him survive, he's going to have to do something. It's not like he quit the job or he's doing something that hurt the job. He just was maybe slightly less available at her convenience. So if you were in this situation, let me know how you would have handled it down below and jerk or not a jerk and why. When I was 15 years old, I ran away from home because I pissed off my parents for a reason that I can't even remember. I didn't have much money, so I decided to hop onto the Sky Train, the public transport train in British Columbia, and ride it as far as it would go. I reached the end of the line in less than an hour and decided I wanted to ride it all the way back again while trying to formulate some kind of plan of how I wanted to live the rest of my life without my parents or anyone. At the last stop, or the first stop depending on your perspective of it, a girl came on and sat in the row right behind me. I didn't pay much attention to her at first. I was busy writing my life plan on a napkin. It was a few minutes later that she got up and sat next to me, curious as to what I was writing. I told her the story and after a few laughs, we began talking about everything and anything. Her name was Amanda, 17 years old and absolutely wonderful. She told me she was getting off the last stop, which was also the first stop depending on how you look at it. It was also the stop that I had gotten on originally. I told her we would ride to it together. The train ride took less than an hour and what a wonderful hour indeed. When the last stop did come, we both knew that we probably wouldn't see each other ever again. This was in the days before cell phones and I was a shy little kid afraid to make moves. As we got to the end of the sidewalk, which split in two different directions, she went right and I went left. Before saying goodbye, she turned to me and asked me a question that has become a wonderful part of my life. She asked me, tell me something you have done or you want to do that you think that I should do. It can be anything, as challenging as you want or as easy. As long as you give me the rest of my life to complete it, I promise I will do it. I was confused as to why, but I thought about it and told her, sing a song a cappella in a room full of strangers. She said, perfect, and then asked me if I would like a challenge as well. I told her I did, and she told 
told me, read from start to finish Ulysses by James Joyce. I have never heard of it at the time, but I agreed and we said our goodbyes. I have an awful memory and I can't remember most conversations I have with people, but I remember all of that clearly. You know why? Because of the challenge that she gave me. In the 12 years that have passed since, I have tried to read that book in over 150 sittings. Every time I open my copy of the 780 page monster of a book, I always think of her and I always think of that day. I've never been sure if it was her intent or not, but she left her lasting memory on me with that challenge. I soon after learned what she did was a completely wonderful and amazing thing for me. So I decided to keep it going. I've met a lot of strangers in my life, some that have become friends and some due to living in different time zones and whatnot that didn't. I don't want to just have experiences and then let them go. I want to remember these meetings and embrace the fact that they happened. So whenever I leave someone who has left an amazing impact in my life, I always make sure to add them to my Ulysses bucket list. I ask them to give me a challenge as difficult or as easy as they want it to be, regardless if they have actually done it or not. Simply something their heart has wanted to do. Some have been easy and fun. I met a man in India nine years ago who told me for a week or a month, cook and buy twice as much food as I intend on eating and give the other half to a stranger in need. I completed that mission eight years ago and thought about that man and the time we had all the way through. I met a girl on a cruise six years ago who told me to jump into a body of water on a slightly cold day without touching or feeling the temperature of the water first. I did that the very same year. I met a couple at an outdoor music festival a few years ago that told me to wear the most bizarre outfit imaginable and walk through a public place, completely oblivious to the fact that I wasn't looking normal. I did that task the very next day at the same festival. Some have been difficult to say the least. Three guys I met in Amsterdam and smoked all night with told me to go to a mall and give 10 strangers 10 presents. That one took a lot of courage, but I did it a year or so after I met them. It was nerve wracking, but at the same time, it was exhilarating leaving my comfort zone. A girl I met on a plane told me to skydive. I'm still in the process of getting that done. A couple that I met in California on the beach told me to tell the five people I hated the most that I love them and respect them. That one was very difficult because of my stubbornness, but I've come close to completing that list many times. I'm still in the process. I have two more people to go. And some things have had an everlasting impact in my life. I met a girl at a music festival who told me that whenever I get mad at someone, walk away. Sing my happy song in my head for five minutes, go back to the person I'm mad at with a calm heart and mind and work things out. I've made this my way of life. I once met a man in a gym in a hotel that I was staying at that told me, whenever your body and brain tells you that you're exhausted and done, use your heart instead and push out two more reps. I've made this my motto when working out or working on any kind of extenuating exercise in which my body demands me to quit. I also use it while working on anything and while studying. One of the best pieces of advice that I've ever received. There are many others that each brought joy to my life. There are still many tasks which I have yet to accomplish and every time I think of these tasks, I think of the people that gave them to me. It amazes me how well I remember all these people. While I can't remember so many aspects of even yesterday, these experiences, not only do I take them for a mission or a challenge, I also take them for a memory of them that never fails to appear inside of my mind. I opened my Ulysses book for probably the 300th time yesterday and read a few pages which prompted me to share this story with you today. I'm in the final 30 pages of the book, also known as the most dreaded of the read. In the last 40 pages or so, James Joyce doesn't use a single punctuation mark, no periods, no commas, no nothing. A straight up 50 page run on sentence. I never saw Amanda after that day, nor do I know if she ever did get a chance to sing a song to a room full of strangers. But what I do know is that she gave me a gift that has never once stopped giving. So wherever you may be, thank you for giving me the Ulysses bucket list. And I swear I'll finish it one day. My life advice, simple, create your own Ulysses bucket list. So one of the most wild parts of this whole story is that he did actually end up finding Amanda in the future. In the update, he said, I'm kind of lacking words at the moment and I'm in awe of the power of the universe. Writing this story was just to relive a moment in my life and to share it with others and maybe help them in some sort of way or just give an entertaining story to read. Never did I think that there was the slightest chance I would actually get to talk to her again, but that's exactly what happened. Last night, I found out that the Amanda
Amanda, that user, that guy who ate knew, was in fact the Amanda that I met 14 years ago. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, I give to you the sincerest thank you I can possibly give. You gave me a chance to continue a life story that stopped writing 14 years ago. I will never forget this. He actually posted a snippet of what Amanda wrote to him in response to his email. The email was called, Hi Amanda, did we meet on the Sky Train 14 years ago? Amanda wrote back and said, Hi, it's me. I do remember meeting you and it's so fascinating that although it's been 14 years and I've moved thrice, that we could actually come in contact with each other and I'm happy to hear that you never made it through the book. That was the plan. I never got past the 35th page and as much as I love to read, that book is impossible to get through. But anyway, since I really doubt we'll ever meet in person again, how did things turn out when you got back home? The OP cut off the rest of the email at that point, but he said, it's not much, but that's all I can give you. Friendship is about trust. I just met her again. I can't go around posting her emails on an open forum. Please don't email me asking for her pictures or any information of that sort. I'm sure you'll all understand. Sometimes the world and the universe seems so significant that you in comparison start feeling small. I can't yet put into words how thankful I am to you all for upvoting the visibility and helping me find that guy who ate, who in turn led me to her. It blows my mind when I really start to think about it. She lives in Georgia now, so it's unlikely that I will get to see her again. But as this story is proof, weirder things have happened. For those of you asking, she sang in front of strangers a few times, but that wasn't the challenge. The challenge was to do it a cappella. I think it's kind of beautiful in a way that she hasn't done hers and I haven't finished Ulysses. I'm still 30 pages away. I told her maybe one day we could Skype and I could read her the last part of Ulysses and she could set up her cam in a bar or a coffee shop somewhere and just start singing. I did not expect him to actually find Amanda and I definitely didn't expect once he found her for her to say that the whole point of her telling him to read that book was so that he wouldn't do it. This guy has basically built his entire life philosophy around this concept and kind of lives by this deep philosophy and it's changed the way he's experienced life all from the way that he interpreted that interaction with her. But then after all those years, he finally gets to talk to her and she just says, I'm happy you never made it through the book. That was the plan. I never got past the 35th page. (laughs) The entire first part of this story sounded like the beginning of a movie. He gets on the train. He has this really moving experience with this girl. And then he's forced to part ways in this kind of heart-wrenching end to their conversation that is only threaded through with this really interesting challenge. And I think this challenge is interesting. I might actually try this in the future with anyone that I meet and see if anyone will actually do this. I just got to think of some good challenges, ones that I would actually want to do myself, which is what this whole thing is based on, at least how he interpreted it. But what would that be for you? Let me know down below. And also, what would you do if you were the OP in this situation? Would you continue keeping up a relationship with Amanda through email or try and meet up. Let me know down below. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. To finish listening to all the stories in this series, use the playlist at the top of the description. And next time you live stream, use the cream of the crop music. Search for cream of the stream on Spotify or whatever music platform you use for copyright free music to use for your stream. It's free cream of the stream. Either way, thanks a lot for listening. I'll see you guys next time.